still hear the. That's okay. <laughs> and apparently, Estelle is in uh, the waiting room. Okay. <laughs> okay. Should we let people in? in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Estelle. We're going to let people in. Hello. Yeah, I've just sent, I've just sent you the. Good. Okay. Great. Because I think Jan is going to say a few words before you speak, Ariane. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Hi, everyone. We're going to wait for two more minutes for everyone to arrive. But welcome to this session. Hi, everyone. Right. Leanne, yes, whenever you want. We can start. Okay, I think, yeah, I think we are good to go. Right. Um, so thank you all for joining, it, joining us um, for this third and last leg of our webinar series on de-anthrocentrism and the politics of matter. Um, today we welcome three speakers um, for a session entitled Telling Matter and dedicated to the stories and narratives that are spun around and from uh, matter. Um, and for those of you who might have missed the past couple of weeks editions on matter and industry and then bodies that matter, um, just a short reminder that recordings will be available um, on my lab's YouTube channel with links to be found on our website, Humanities After Humans. Um, they'll make for great viewing to add to your lockdown must watch list, I think. Um, today we'll start with a keynote by Ariane Fento um, and we'll have some time for questions um, before moving on to the other two papers for the day. And then we'll have a general Q&A at the end. Um, and throughout, your quest, uh, your, sorry, throughout the, the session, you can type down your questions um, in the conversation box or you can raise your hand at the, uh, at the end and just ask your questions directly, um, whatever you feel more comfortable with. Right, um, so without further ado, um, I will um, start by introducing our keynote um, for the day. Ariane Fento is an associate professor at Université de Paris, Paris Diderot, and a member of the research team LARCA. Um, her research covers 18th and 19th century um, and material culture with a specific focus on dress and textiles. Uh, her monograph, The Pocket, a, His a Hidden History of Women's Lives, 1660-1900, um, co-written with Barbara Berman, was published with Yale University Press in May 2019. Um, she's currently working on 18th century and 19th um, century material culture in a global context. Uh, more specifically, she's the principal instigator of the Glo Global Matters Research Project, which studies global material circulations and the history of techniques. Um, the project is jointly supported by LARCA, CRCAO, ICT, Sphere, and LIED, and um, collaboration between museum curators and Paris Diderot Video Studio led to a series of short outreach videos that provide insights into aspects of the research. Her upcoming project is on the use of animal products in dress in relation to the British Empire. And we are particularly grateful to Ariane for agreeing to be our keynote today as her young children have been out of school lately and we all know how tricky that can be. Um, Ariane, you have the floor. Oh, sorry, um, Ariane's keynote is entitled The Politics of Material Sources, Objects and the Archiving of Margins. And there you go, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan, uh, Sarah, uh, and Estelle for inviting me um, to be the keynote for this exciting series. I'm sorry I couldn't attend um, uh, the other days uh, in between teaching and then not quite homeschooling yet, but uh, uh, having young kids at home. Um, I suppose uh, we all know that it's sometimes difficult to do everything you'd like to do. Um, Anyway, so let me start. Can you see my screen? Yes. So despite most historians usually recognizing the historical value of objects as sources, 
that traditionally have been reluctant to actually integrate material documents as part of their sources. There is the idea that material sources may have value as resources for archaeologists or prehistorians, but that in a way history proper uh, should concern itself with written documentation. What underpins um, this separation is the notion that studying objects is a valid historical enterprise in the absence of other um, more reliable sources. Objects are sort of second to best type of document for historians, which they're forced to make do with when texts are missing. Integral to this epistemological hierarchy is the primacy given to texts and more particularly to texts as being specific to humankind, a sign of our supposed superior intellect. The capacity to read and write is often seen as what makes us, what makes humans distinctive after all, if not plainly superior to other species and beings. Yet it is the contention of material culture as a discipline that objects um, are not just alternative, but imperative sources for the writing of history. Material culture is a discipline that has a much longer history than the term, material term, which we encounter these days, seems to indicate. It's not just a, just a turn in the road. Um, it takes its source um, in anthropology and ethnology and is grounded in methods first developed by art historians, archaeologists, and later folk historians. So I'll do a sort of brief genealogy of the field maybe before I start. A key genealogy for the field of material culture undoubtedly is A.B. Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, there are arrows, I think, at the bottom. Sorry. There you go. Oh, yeah. Is undoubtedly A.B. Warburg's so-called humanist approach, which we would now probably call not so much humanist, uh, especially <laughs> given the title of the of the conference, uh, which we would call probably today pluridisciplinary, but which at the time was um, quite um, revolutionary in a way, um, to art history, which uh, already therefore in the 1930s was crossing disciplinary divides uh, and forging epistemological alliances between art and the social sciences, suggesting works of art were not only aesthetic objects, but also social and cultural productions that needed to be embedded into social, political, and economic dynamics and realities. Um, another key influence, I've just given you um, just a quote um, from you know, one of the earlier articles of the, um, the Journal of the Courtauld and the Wahlberg Institute where the, the, the ideas of Wahlberg were perspire. Um, uh, another, uh, uh, um, Sorry, another um, uh, source um, of this um, approach or the material culture approach uh, undoubtedly uh, goes to, or must be credited to uh, ethnology and anthropology developed around, which was developed around the same time in France uh, under the influence of Marcel Mauss, uh, for whom the collecting of even humble objects was key to understanding the cultures that had produced and used them. And here I'm just giving you a few quotes. Uh, so this is not a book that was, it's, it's a book that's not, um, doesn't have an official author, but it's um, thought to be written by students of Moss and to have to reflect his approach um, to objects um, as being central to ethnology. Uh, and the idea was to give guidelines on what objects to collect to form ethnographic collections. Uh, and it's it's a bit of a, um, a founding text for ethnology. Les objets les plus communs sont ceux qui nous apprennent souvent le plus sur une civilisation. And the famous example he cites is that the boîte de conserve, so the tin, uh, is probably more telling uh, of a civilization or society than the most precious objects or the most rarest stamp is the other example he contrasts it with. Um, the MA in early American culture that was co-founded at Winterthur uh, with the University of Delaware in 1952, however, marked the beginning of the existence of material culture as an academic field 
and as an academic discipline rather in its own right, uh, with um, its kind of tenets being um, explored in the pages of the Winters Up portfolio. And here I've, I've just given two key texts um, for the, the kind of uh, um, um, uh, expression, a setting out of the method and approach of material culture as a discipline. Um, it is mostly indeed in the Anglo speaking world that this field honed in on its epistemological approach, an approach based on the study of surviving artifacts as meaningful carriers of history, rather than seeing objects as inferior to more traditional historical sources, Henry Glessy, one of the most articulate proponents of material culture, who wrote a little bit later in the 90s, explains that they should be seen as archiving specific fields of knowledge that are thus sometimes and are thus sometimes richer, more telling than words. Things composed of words and things crafted out of scraps of the world differ in the experience to in the experiences to which they bear witness. It would be a mistake to assume that they say the same thing and that the written document is the more reliable source. Sorry, I forgot the end of the quotation mark. Um, she also says, sorry, um, uh, uh, another quote, uh, which I um, also find quite telling, material culture is as true to the mind, as dear to the heart as language. And what is more, it reports thoughts and actions that resist verbal formulation. In this respect, what historian Carlo Ginsberg calls conjectural knowledge, that is the tacit embodied knowledge of makers and craftsmen, for instance, um, that has not uh, readily be captured in words. But if Ginsberg underlines the crucial importance of this, of these kind of non-verbal spheres of knowledge, he stops short of resorting to objects as keys to unlocking their muted volubility. As Richard Sennett uh, has noted, the word often fails to capture the knowing gestures it is supposed to describe or explain something we encounter countless examples when reading technical descriptions of the past of past practices or something we have all experienced, I'm sure, when grappling with instruction manuals for how to mount IKEA furniture. For me, more seriously, this is the key to the power of objects as archives. Studies, I quote again from Glassy, studies focused on words, whether written or spoken, omit whole spheres of experience that are cumbersomely framed in language, but gracefully shaped into artifacts. We miss more than most people when we restrict historical research to verbal documents. We miss the wildless experience of all people, rich or poor, near or far. And this is where the politics of material culture or material sources comes in. The question thus is not merely how are we to write the history of making, how are gestures archived if not by the written, if they're not archived by the written word, but in a way whose history we are writing when we omit non-verbal sources. What about those who were not literate to leave written traces behind, like women, the poor? the illiterate, or cultures with no, <clears throat> sorry, written tradition. If focusing on the written word, in effect, writing the history of the dominant, mostly white, mostly male literate few who were privileged enough to leave written records, which we then pick up and write about. By excluding other types of sources, are we not just thus reproducing the power dynamics that underpin varying access and resort to the written word. Seen in this light, material sources may be seen not as marginal sources, but precisely as archiving the knowledge and experiences of those excluded from power, those in the margins or in the peripheries, at least the peripheries of written, of the written word. 
My research has explored several of these margins, whether gender-based, as we will develop um, now, or in other projects, the margins of the colonial empire through a close study of traded objects, which I see as kind of sites of encounter, negotiation, and subversion between the colonized and uh, the uh, colonizers, um, between European traders and, Europe and Indian artisans, for instance. Uh, but today I will um, focus on a case study based on my book, which I co-wrote with Barbara Berman. Here I show you the table of contents and the uh, paperback um, cover, uh, which was uh, issued last year. Um, so to try and make a case for the use of, in this particular instance, textile objects as vital archives for the writing of her story. In a seminal article entitled Of Pens and Needles, historian Laurel Thatcher Ulrich underlines the gender bias of the traditional archive. She writes, I soon learned that researching women's lives meant sifting through hundreds of pages of court records, sermons, diaries, family letters, and account books, almost literally looking for needles that is the evidence of women's lives in haystacks of male prose. To write the history of women's experience, she instead turns to women's nonverbal productions in the shape of their needlework. Because far more women were accustomed to using needles than pens, uh, textiles may offer the richest unexplored body of information in early American women's history. Women's stitchery, both plain and fancy, offers ways of examining class division, sorry, class divisions, education, technology and commerce, family relations, attitudes towards the body, work and leisure, marriage and death. The 19th century um, nursery rhyme, Lucy Lockett lost her pocket, is perhaps the only shared memory of the otherwise mostly forgotten object I am about to discuss. Yet, um, every day between the late 17th and the late 19th centuries, women and girls of all social classes wore detachable pockets like Lucy's. They tied them around their waist, independently of their clothing, reached them through openings in, the petticoat, in their petticoats and dresses and put them on and off at will. Pockets may, may seem obscure now, but when resorted or restored, sorry, to our attention, they open up a rich nexus of historical questions ranging from women's domesticity and work to agency, from possession to financial independence and from consumer practices to privacy. Far from being insignificant, they actually offer, offer sorry, a disconcertingly fruitful insight into women's lives and experiences of the past and bring an important contribution, we feel, to understanding of women's relationship to possession, consumption, mobility, work, social media, or privacy in the 200 years in which they were in use. In his milestone book, In Small Things Forgotten, uh, James Dietz draws attention to the wealth of information and meaning contained in small things for the historian. It is terribly important that the small things forgotten be remembered, for in the seemingly little and insignificant things that accumulate to create a lifetime, the essence of our existence is captured. We must remember these bits and pieces, and we must use them in new and imaginative ways so that a different appreciation for what life is today and was in the past can be achieved. The written document has its proper and important place, but there is also a time when we should set aside a perusal of diaries, court records, and inventories and listen to another voice. Dietz makes a double call to remember and study small things and to use them as sources for historical inquiry. Our contention in the book is that objects matter to the writing of history, as you would have understood by now. Uh, and that they specifically matter 
if you intend to delve into women's past at a time when traditional literacy was a male rather than a female preserve, when only a minority of women could read and write, but all wore a pocket and all, whether they be a duchess, an innkeeper, a potato seller or a prostitute, could more or less aptly hold and use a needle, objects themselves carry key epistemological and political clout as tools to excavate the lives and experiences of past women of all walks of life and origin and not just the literate one. Um, our other contention is that a small thing and a small marginal thing uh, can open up big historical questions. Pockets are seemingly inconse inconsequential and trifle on various counts. They are utilitarian, they're everyday, they're commonplace, they're textile, they're female. So they score pretty low uh, in the hierarchy of, of noble and important historical topics. Yet we argue that pockets are worth studying not just despite their smallness and apparent marginality, but precisely because of their smallness and liminal status. There is a specific heuristic power of smallness and marginality, we argue, by refocusing or by fast forcing the gaze to refocus, it recalibrates and decenters our vision, asks different questions, and hopefully gives more complicated answers. Rather typically, women's pockets um, were so much part of the everyday experience of women of the period that they have left relatively few traces in the sources traditionally used by historians. Often handmade and of little value, they are seldom listed in in, sorry, in merchants' le ledgers or inventories or wills, for instance. Of, of course, sometimes they're, you know, they're, they're there and we're happy to find them. Um, and as they're usually worn under the skirt, um, they only make discrete serendipitous appearances in paintings and engravings. Um, uh, the fact that they're taken for granted um, means that they're, and they're very everyday, means that they're seldom described or even mentioned in, in written, in correspondence, in unpublished texts or published texts. Um, so that carrying out a social and cultural history of pockets um, or of women through their pockets requires that, of course, one draws on all of these, as well as on maybe more indirect sources like court records or coroner's reports, uh, which for women who left no diary behind um, are especially important uh, as they shared information that is not just quantitative, but also qualitative about how women use their pockets on an everyday basis. Whilst the study of over 390 extant pockets uh, we studied in about 30 UK collections, both private and public, form um, an irreplaceable body of evidence whose testimony the book foregrounds. And here I'm just giving you uh, some examples of, of the survey. One of the criticisms made by historians uh, to people like us working with objects is that items that have been kept in museums are socially unrepresentative. Uh, five fine specimens, sorry, being more likely to be preserved than mundane ones. Now, if this is true of some of the collections, such as those of the Victoria and Albert Museum, for instance, or here, this is a really fine example from Bath, uh, here more fine examples. Um, uh, this is not, uh, the, the, it's not true of all collections. The, the collection of the VNA has, the policy has very much been led by the idea of fine, preserving fine examples, uh, examples of fine workmanship. Uh, but other collections on the contrary have been purposely constructed around the idea of preserving plebeian heritage. Now, if you look at their pockets, they're made in hard wearing materials and their work machine, workmanship is sometimes crude. They exhibit many signs of wear that testify to the work they did for their owners, for their less privileged owners. It is our contention therefore that in its extent and diversity, our survey registers evidence that cannot easily be garnered from other sources at a time 
when material literacy was much more widespread than textual literacy. The first lesson, if I may say so, learned from a material archive is, has to do with the chronology of our objects, um, which unlike what fashion historians had thought, um, did not disappear uh, at the end of the 18th century uh, and did not or was not replaced by reticules uh, when uh, in circa 1800, um, when women started wearing high-waisted gowns and the reticule kind of made its appearance in the fashion press. Now this narrative, which if you don't really know much about uh, dress history, you might not have been, been aware that I'm kind of doing a revisionist history of the pocket here, but I'll, I'll explain why I'm still drawing your attention to that in a minute. So this narrative had derived in a way um, from looking exclusively at print-based sources such as fashion prints and newspaper articles in the female press at the time, which indeed pitted the old fashion pockets against the new modern reticule. Yet, as evidenced by many dated examples in our survey, as well as by some pockets using um, easily datable technologies such as metal fastening or um, machine stitching, um, we see that these were premature obituaries for the pocket, which in reality adapted and continued being worn well into the 19th century, actually to the very end of the 19th century and in some um, modified form, even in the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century. Um, so just, um, I can uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, images to prove my point. Uh, here you can see the pockets, and this is the waltz. So this is the new fashion, new fashionable dance. So these are fashionable women, and they are wearing pockets. Uh, and obviously, we have material sources um, that show that the pocket actually adapted to these um, masculine dresses rather than dis words disappeared or displaced by the reticule. Um, what's this? Um, persistence of pockets shows, though, um, is that sartorial choices and consumption um, are not all governed by a desire to shine or emulate. And they point in a way that points to a fundamental difference between dress and fashion, as pockets were, in a sense, uh, unfashionable for about 150 years, and yet they persisted. They were um, uh, they were criticized as being unfashionable in a lot of discourses, often male authored discourses. And yet, women, despite being told you should move on, these are unfashionable things, this is the accessory of your grandmother, they still carry their pockets. Um, now, with specimens um, often measuring um, over 40 centimeters, centimeters, centimeters sorry, in length sometimes up to 60 centimeters. This is the big mammal pocket in the collection. This is the enormous pair we have, uh, but they're more routinely 40 and 30, 40 long and 30 across. A survey of, of surviving pockets illustrates one very pragmatic reason they might have persisted. It is that they were extremely practical and capacious, something which the shoplifters uh, trials illustrate in rather baffling ways. Sarah Gladman in 1806, for instance, managed to stuff in her pockets, presumably they were described as ex extremely large by the judge, uh, 25 yards of gingham, as well as 50 yards of printed cotton. So imagine 70 yards of, of fabric. Uh, whilst Phoebe Morris made off with 40 potatoes, again, imagine the weight of 40 potatoes, even if they're small potatoes, in her pockets in 1839. And Jane Griffiths, a farmhand, took her chances in 1777 with two live ducks, presumably one in each pocket. Capaciousness didn't um, just serve criminals. Uh, when a lady was attacked on Barnes Commons in London in 17. Her pockets contained, among other things, we are told by the ad, 
a small tortoiseshell snuff box, a London almanac in a black sh chagrin case, an ivory carved toothpick case, a silver sliding pencil, a white colonial seal, uh, a tortoiseshell comb in a case, a silver thimble and botkin, a bunch of keys, a red leather pocketbook, a green knit pass containing half a guinea, a crown piece of William and Mary, and about five shillings with two glass smelling bottles. The roll call of nearly 15 objects, uh, a lot of them made of metal or heavy materials, all carried in the pocket by the well-to-do woman, illustrates the host of pocket-sized accessories which the consumer society produced specifically for the pocket. In an age of um, expanding consumption, the small space of the pocket was indeed the focus of an ever encroaching marketplace that produced innumerable pocket accessories enabling to carry and keep at hand the wherewithal of polite sociability in miniature form. The commodification of the pocket did uh, space did not uh, escape commentators like Adam Smith, who in the theory of moral sentiments, for instance, wrote, how many people ruin themselves by laying out money on tr trinkets of frivolous utility. All their pockets are stuffed with little conveniences. They contrive new pockets unknown in the clothes of other people in order to carry a greater number. Yet, Despite the contemporary um, commentary on how um, people and especially women kind of fill their pockets with useless trifle objects, um, which obviously is a comment on women's um, inordinate consumption, um, the contemporary, uh, the, the, our sources, our cr the criminal sources we looked at, uh, tell a, a slightly different story. Almost contemporary with the woman attacked on Barnes Common with all the heavy and rich, you know, pocket with rich contents, another woman uh, was attacked just a year, late, a year earlier in London. And she lost, according to uh, the trial, one ticking pocket, ticking being a really cheap fabric, um, one value one penny, one iron key, value two pence, one pen knife, value one penny one brass thimble, value one hay penny. The things in a pocket may have been modest, but they could be rich and varied in meanings, however. If a key suggests um, independence and security, a pen knife could be an indication of potential literacy or education, whilst the brass thimble could hold the promise of waged labor, uh, indicate a well-kept household, was also having potentially personal associations as symbols we know were often um, given between friends and uh, lovers. Um, the contents of a woman's pockets, therefore, whether ample or meager, are more than a yardstick of plenty and want or want, luxury and necessity. The inside of a woman's pocket, once glimpsed, is a suggestive place a miniature cosmos that can tell us how a woman could own, use, think about material things, an index also as to, she, as to how she saw and imagined herself in this world. In a context where privacy was a privilege enjoyed by few, pockets also afforded women a space they could hope at least to call their own, where they could enjoy a modicum of privacy, although this was always fragile and contested, as we are reminded constantly by sources. And obviously, we know about sources when pockets have failed in their work of providing privacy. Otherwise, we would not know. So we are reminded um, of this um, in a domestic drama um, that unfolded in August 1770 in a London lodging house. Um, one of the lodgers, Elizabeth Warner, an unmarried former servant, was charged with killing her newborn baby daughter in a house. Suspected by the landlady of having given birth, Elizabeth, at first prevaricated, no doubt in dread of the possible charge of the capital crime of infanticide, but then confessed to an early miscarriage in the privy. Mrs. Smith, the midwife, 
was called to the house to investigate the goings on. She describes the search. There was a box call, a box locked. I asked her for the key. She would not let me have it till I threatened to break the box open. I opened the box and found a parcel of dirty things. I found the afterbath in a leather pocket. I looked farther and found the little child wrapped up in one of the prisoner's shifts and petticoats, dead. Elizabeth's sad tale of loss and fear manifests how it was to her leather pocket that Elizabeth entrusted her safety and privacy when, in extremis, she bundled, she bundled into it the evidence from her own body. The role of pockets as guardians of women's desires, hopes, and secrets is repeatedly illustrated in sources, but as objects, I mean written sources, but as objects, pocket themselves materialize protection with a womb-like shape and their inner compartments that uh, provide um, sometimes private pockets which structure the contents of the pockets. So you often have pockets within pockets. In this respect, by defining an inside and an outside, the embroidered floral motifs that circle the opening of many 18th century pockets give material expression to the guardianship of this protected space and its contents by the wearer slash maker, implementing a specifically female technology of containment, which anthropologists remind us is always also a technology of the self. A small pocket in a private collection gives potent shape to this embroidered as it is in human hair with small hearts on either side of its opening. It was made by an inmate of the Duke Street Prison in Glasgow and given to the governor's wife in 1851. Embroidered in hair with the full name of its maker, Margaret Diaz, the heart and the motto to get me not. This object gives striking expression to pockets as manifestation of personal identity and the possibility of privacy, especially given the context of close confinement in which the object was made. Pockets didn't need to carry the DNA of their maker to become strong carriers of identity, though. Whether brazenly emblazoned at the front or more discreetly integrated into its decorative pattern, many pockets carry the name or initials of their owners, whilst others that may first appear plain and unremarkable when looked at closely can start to divulge a number of details, each fragmentary, but collectively building a more rounded picture of the pocket's significance to its owner. The toil of many plebeian women, or plebeian women, sorry, can be read in the signs of wear, tear, and strain by, borne by many pockets. At the same time, the dance and repairs, the traces of recycling of the surviving artifacts manifests women's practical tactics to make things last. Plebeian women apply their skills and cunning in order to extend the life cycle of objects that were essential to their existence by clever or crude donning, reinforcement and mending. Jane Thomas uh, was going to market to sell her husband's producing wells in the second half of the 19th century wearing these pockets. The back of her pockets, like a palimpsest, embody her preservation strategies for these utilitarian but companionate objects worked to bits and patched to within an inch of their lives. The pockets register her unrelenting efforts to prolong their usefulness, but also the amount of care and work that went into preserving these evidently much loved objects. This material bricolage that is visible on extent pockets is often resourceful and creative. These women may or may not have been literate, but like Lévi-Strauss's bricoleur, can they, they can be said to speak 
with things, but also through the medium of things, of their things. A group of five pockets all coming from the same household illustrates how the particularity of a stitch or of a patch can act as a signature. Despite their subtle differences, they share all a kind of similar rhetoric of mending. And in the kinship of their patches, what can be read is the singularity of the hand, a unique presence. Whoever made and repaired these pockets is unknown to us, but for her patched up pockets. Yet in the, strat in the stratigraphy of patches visible um, on, on these pockets, the woman undeniably has left her mark. Looked closely, the stitches and patches and pockets thus illuminate what those women meant when they said repeatedly in court trials that they could recognize their own work or indeed their own mending on stolen items. In 1794, Elizabeth Horde, whose house had been um, burgled uh, or broken into, could positively swear in court to a pair of pockets saying, they are mine, they are patchwork of my own doing. While Mary Butler, recognizing her things, <clears throat> uh, recognized her things telling the court uh, in specific relation, sorry, uh, uh, do, 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 I'm, I've lost my line, um, telling the court in 1797, these things are all my property. Here's an apron, apron of my own mending. I have no doubt that they are all mine. Women's, and I'm giving you just some more examples. Women's hands-on engagement with the material nurtured a specific relation to objects where the smallest detail of construction in something they had made, the peculiarity of the stitch, um, <clears throat> could become meaningful carriers, not only of identification, but also of identity. The intimate bond fostered by making or repairing things that such words evoke is difficult to grasp with the historian. In the absence of words, surviving pockets might be the only source that registers something of this bond. And in the case of less privileged women, something of the existence of those who left no written record behind. So to conclude, I would like to turn back or go back to Dietz called Not to Forget Small Things. An initial, a stitch, a stain, a knot, the marks of strain and pull in particular places, the grime, the wear, the efforts deployed to repair, a crease mark, a hole, an inked number. All these things, all these little things have big stories to tell if you care to listen. Obviously, this comes with responsibilities. There is an ethics to the use of material sources as the material historians has to accept the kind of strange responsibility of putting into words that which is not verbal, to use Glass's nice um, phrase. But my contention is that the ethics of using objects as sources is in effect no different to that of any historical writing, which at best can give an interpretation of the past rather than claim to either resuscitate this past or achieve any historical truth. As such, it may caution us into humility, reminding us that we can only know about culture as it cycles in flashes and scraps through the sensate. This is another quote by Glessie. The fundamental poise and tension between certainty and doubt that comes with any writing about the past reminds us that the past was at one point full of the potentials of its future and that as historians, our role is to lend an ear and then a voice to this tremor. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you so much, um, Ariane, for this wonderful keynote, um, which I'm sure will have inspired um, um, everybody. Just We were just, yeah. <laughs> um, just uh, fascinated. Um, do we have questions for a quick um, um, question session now? Do we have any questions? 
do not hesitate to raise your hands. If not, I actually have a question, but I, I don't want to. Um, sorry. Um, so um, I actually, I, I wanted to ask a question that sort of, um, that addresses what you said, but also ties in with um, your upcoming project on animal products and the, and the Indian empire, um, because that, um, the mention of it echoed um, um, Kirsty Sinclair's keynote from two weeks ago, um, in which she um, she had a whole um, um, part dedicated to Indian yellow, um, and that, that you know the use of that dye. Yes, I think you you, you need to get in touch. Yeah. <laughs> that all makes sense. <laughs> um, so, and I'm sorry if this sounds um, a little bit strange. Um, I was just wondering. Um, do you think there's a logical continuity um, or is there a logical continuity in your work between nonverbal humans and nonverbal beings beyond or outside um, the human realm? Um, I, I was, yeah, I'm wondering that there seems to be a way in which um, those objects that we, um, that, that we look at um, when it comes to um, um, humans are still sort of we're still looking um, for the stories or the voices of those humans that were, who were, you know, left by the wayside in more conventional um, channels of history. And so I was wondering, how do we make that compatible with non-speaking creatures? You know, is there a sort of, is a next step necessary to make space for creatures that um, aren't just unheard, but just non-speaking? Uh, thank you. That's a really interesting question because that's uh, actually at the kind of heart of what I'm thinking about um, now. Uh, I suppose um, uh, if if I'm reflecting about my parcours or you know the the the, the way I've moved from one topic to another, um, I'm start I'm starting to think I'm running away from humans. Uh, in my research as much as I can and that maybe objects in a way were a fast step because now I'm thinking about animals um, and I read things about um, animals or they've been used as objects and for me objects is not like a derogatory thing, object is, is, is full of potential, is full of agency and in the, in the um, uh, literature on animal studies it's interesting because in a way you kind of find the same um, discourse uh, about, oh, can you, you know, um, what can you know? They can't speak. So the objects are mute. You know, this is what people say. You've got, you know, you're putting words into your evidence because they can't say anything. And in a way, the animals are the same. But it is true that with objects, they are artifacts. So they are made. Uh, I mean, I guess there's a whole question about what is an object. Um, and the, the difference between an object and a thing and whether anything is not an object as uh, and usually the difference is an object is made by man and a thing is made by nature but as we know uh, the Anthropocene means that there's nothing much that is untouched by human presence so uh, you know even a rock uh, is um, some anthropologists argue uh, even if it hasn't been cut, is still, you know, part of that web of um, things that human presence impacts on. Um, but I, I do find that I am moving more towards the non-human in a way. Um, I don't know what, what that means, but it, it is part of the questions I'm asking myself, definitely. And I think it, there's fascinating links between objects and animals uh, in relation to where they stand in relation to humans. And one of the things that, one of the criticisms that was aimed at, at the book, um, which came from a literary scholar, uh, was that, um, you know, we were kind of put in the same bag, if I may say, as um, sort of you know, easy or, you know, that new trend in material culture. Um, and, you know, being obsessed with objects means that you're not interested in human beings when uh, precisely in the, in the book, uh, we look at objects as they tell us about, because they tell us about human interactions. Um, I don't know whether that 
precisely answers your question, but it's definitely part of my uh, questions at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I think that, and that really echoes uh, so many of the, the questions that we've been asking ourselves. I think that's, that's perfect, thank you. Um, Jean-Michel, you had a question. Yes, thank you, Jen. Uh, thanks a lot for the beautiful, very stimulating presentation, really. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there, there are many echoes. Uh, it's very useful for uh, not only historians, but also literary scholars, uh, I'm sure, because uh, we've been working a lot on many things like uh, the humble, for example, here in Montpellier. Uh, and, um, and of course, okay, there, there are many contemporary authors who uh, resurrect okay, things like um, uh, 18th century narratives, okay, which like, uh, um, well, about objects, okay, and, um, and so forth, of which you're very familiar. Um, uh, um, yes, you, you, you take it, but, um, you, you take the female object, the paraphernalia, okay, as your uh, study, your, your main interest. Uh, what I find striking is that in uh, contemporary production, okay, there are very many uh, male novelists okay, who go back to this idea of uh, uh, the ordinary object. Okay, uh, for example, uh, John McGregor in his second novel, okay, uses uh, this um, uh, topos really and and builds writes a novel, okay, around um, as a collector around items which are very uh, humble items, okay, from which uh, he unravels the story, okay, using their potential and their materiality really so that's the first point but more generally what i uh very much enjoyed in when listening to you was this idea of uh, what you come up with at the end the things are visible if or audible if we care to listen to them and from there you jump to this idea of ethics okay and um uh, i find that with a corpus such as yours okay this idea of uh, an ethics of uh, attention uh, is um, brought about, okay, by the, the type of corpus you're having a look at. So um, this made me think of uh, what the people working with ordinary language philosophy uh, are trying to, uh, to to put together. That is this idea that uh, it is in uh what you have a look at okay that you find what matters uh as opposed to the big abstract principles uh that you could find in uh rule books or whatever and um uh in this way okay i, I see of course the way you twitch the uh, an ethics okay of attention to what is invisible but also also to what is visible okay in uh Foucault's terms this time okay uh is right the heart of your project w would you uh agree with this well, uh, there's quite a few references I'm not aware of, so uh, yeah. I'd be very grateful, for instance, the John McGregor uh, yeah. novel, I, uh, so I'd be um, really interested in that. Um, well, I think, obviously, the question of ethics is, should be or is central to every field uh, and should be at the center of any research. Uh, I think uh, working with objects, you kind of have to be more probably uh, guarded because you're often criticized, um, uh, 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 less so now maybe, but still. Um, so you kind of have to build in a defense uh, in your argument uh, about um, why you can do what you do or why uh, what you should do is legitimate. Um, um, I guess it's, um, it comes in a way with the territory of, of write, on writing or working on, as you said, humble, uh, less um, established uh, fields or objects within that field, because then you have um, objects that are more uh, noble in a way you know um, it's okay to uh, it's 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 more acceptable to work on uh, porcelain and uh, fine workmanship on ebenisterie goods but maybe not so on something that is grimy smells <laughs> Uh, that is kept in museums because it, it does imbibe the sweat and the smell and it's dirty, you know, it, it is dirty, but in a way it's because it's dirty that it's interesting. 
uh, from my perspective. Um, but you're right in um, saying that there is a sort of, uh, and probably an added ethical um, or both political and therefore the, the flip coin is, is ethical responsibility uh, in making visible um, these less visible um, objects. I don't know whether that's really answering your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. I'll send you a reference of, uh, to the McGregor book. Thank you. You're right. Thanks. Thank you. I think, yeah, Saha, you have a question. Go on. Yes, can I ask a quick uh, question? So it, it, I'm going to start with a kind of a platitude, which is the fact that today men don't have to carry anything because women carry purses, handbags, and you know if a, a, a man, I don't know, cuts himself in the street, there will be all sorts of women pulling out tissues and napkins out of their handbags. So I was wondering, you gave us quite comprehensive lists of the different items in these pockets. But I was wondering if there were items that you recognized as being, I don't know, um, yeah, for, I don't know, um, directed uh, to, not to men, but for the, for the household, you know, that were not only for women, but for, maybe you said it, but uh, I wanted to know if you, um, worth thinking about that also. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't mention that, uh, but you're right to say that um, in the talk, I, I uh, talked more about the pocket as a personal space, but it, um, it was both a personal and a shared space. Um, so it was a space uh, for the household. It was a space for, uh, in a way, the multiplicity of women's roles. Um, so there were friends, um, so that the, the pocket contains the kind of web of female friendships uh, because you make pockets for friends, uh, you um, carry objects in your pocket that were given by friends. There's a kind of traffic of things inside and uh, women's pockets that um, in a way materializes these um, bonds of friendship and um, um, sometimes love, but uh, also very often friendship uh, between women. Uh, it's also a shared space for the household. Uh, you often have women carrying things for their children or, you know, sort of a, a bib or um, something that um, a, a, a child's a little hat. Um, so other, ex, you know, other accessories that are kept in the pocket if you need it. Uh, ha the handkerchief, for instance, or which uh, in the 18th century was very much a, not so much something to blow your nose, but a, like a scarf, you know, a neckerchief. Um, that's also often in pockets, and pockets also acted as a communal pass uh, for the man and, and the husband, uh, the husband and wife, sorry, uh, the man and woman. Uh, sometimes, I guess, people didn't have deposit banks. Um, and the pocket was often the, the next best thing because it could easily be stored under the head, uh, under the pillow when you uh, slept. So um, because you didn't really have locked furniture, you lived in shared accommodation where you couldn't really secure your belongings. That was as close as it could be kept and therefore as secure as it was thought to be. But obviously we know of these stories when they have failed. <laughs> Um, but they were still trusted, at least hoped to be um, the best option um, for safeguarding um, um, often shared property. And obviously, for most of the century we studied, a lot of the things that are in women's pockets are not legally women's. They are wrecked because of women not having no recognized um, um, title to entitlement to. Uh, property, but obviously these small possessions are still, although in the eyes of the law, when they go to court, um, they, they are thought to be the husband's, they're legally, it's, it's stolen off the husband from the body of the wife kind of thing, um, but it's still recognized in the discourse that you hear 
as still theirs. So there's a, an interesting conflation about possession, uh, which is not legally women's, but still kind of informally recognized as being theirs. And they are uh, thought to have um, suffered the prejudice of, of, the, of the theft, although the possession of it is, you know, and the money at the beginning, you have an indictment with how much, what the goods were stolen and how much they're worth. That is the property of the husband when they're married. Um, so, but you still have both. It's very much a sort of laboratory for uh, ownership in a way. What's ownership? What's possession? The difference between ownership and possession. Thank you. Much. Thank you. And, and you did have sticky plasters also. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this um, will sort of um, um, make an echo, um, echo uh, what, um, what we've been um, saying. There's a question there, conversation box from a person who um, cannot use their mic. Um, the question reads, um, I have, so um, the pocket seems to have a radical potential and potency, a hidden article or a second room. Um, I'd like to know if you have researched into their use in witchcraft. Is it also known whether the pocket was seen as sacred? Um, um, so, you know, not to, in other words, not to be touched by men. Um, and the person would also like to know if they were used by those of fluid gender. Um, okay, so about witchcraft. Uh, um, so, um, about radicalism before witchcraft radicalism uh, it's it, it's interesting that pockets were not we haven't seen pockets that carry sort of seditious messages um the way for instance uh you know in the 18th century with the jacobite um sort of rebellion people being pro-jacobite or uh, believe in the glorious revolution, you have other objects of material culture that kind of carry, say, Jacobite messages. Um, so uh, pockets that have survived, uh, at least um, do not um, show us that, although there may be messages that we cannot decipher, you know, you, but they, they, there's no pocket with a political message on it that we have found. Um, later, uh, when suffragettes, um, you know, want to get the vote, um, there's um, um, famous examples of, of uh, suffragettes carrying firebombs uh, in their pockets, so they have that potential. Um, about witchcraft, um, so there are documented examples that we um, discuss in the book um, of pockets being um, used in beneficial magic um, um, rituals uh, and in particular of pockets being uh, enclosed in within walls on purpose to so like deliberately concealed garments um, which you know pockets were not the only type of garment you also uh, immured um, shoes for instance there are examples of stays that have been um, found inside walls. Uh, often they're placed outside or above windows, chimneys or doors, so like um, areas of opening of the house um, as a kind of ritual of protection, which is thought to be a ritual of protection to kind of guard off, ward off evil uh, entries into the house where, you know, impenetrable areas of the house and in the two cases that we have found there, in um, we haven't found them in the walls. Uh, archaeologists have found them, but we um, sort of an analyzed these findings um, there in Oxfordshire. Um, and in both cases, there's a baby's cap inside the pocket. And in both cases, the pockets were uh, used. They're not new pockets. They're pockets that had been used. Um, sometimes that are broken and repaired, um, but are still functional. They could function as pockets. They're not past their use. Uh, and in the most um, interesting one, because it's got the most objects, uh, there's a baby cap, uh, money, letters, which obviously, uh, unfortunately, we can't read anymore, but there's different papers. 
um, and it seems like the objects all date from different time periods across um, about um, 200 years. So there's a kind of cumulative history that is interred in the walls. And obviously these finds are really suggestive, but uh, we cannot be sure exactly what um, you know, the rationale of, of, of putting these objects together in that pocket and then entering that pocket in the wall actually meant what was um, never verbalized even at the time, you know, why would you put this coin and not that coin and uh, is obviously at best oral history, at best, um, but that they, they did play a part in those, in, in those um, uh, rituals of beneficial magic. Witchcraft, we don't, we haven't got, we haven't come across it. And was there any another uh, part of the question? I can't remember. Ah, oh, yeah, uh, fluid. Um, so um, the uh, we have uh, examples of pockets being worn by men who cross-dressed, if that's what you had in mind, um, and often. Um, but so the actual acts of cross-dressing, men adopting the dress of women and as part of this adoption is also adopting the pockets. And uh, what's interesting about these cases is that when they're um, reported in the press, often it's uh, like a scandalous story. Um, and it's about um, the pocket is in a way the kind of icing on the cake of how um, outrageous the story is. Uh, and one famous example is the Chevalier Dion. So the Chevalier Dion is a famous um, French um, cross-dresser um, who at one point lived in London and he was uh, going about in a female dress, but he got into a fight uh, at the theatre uh, during one night, uh, at one time, one night at the theatre and uh, the commentary is outraged, especially because it, he, uh, fighting, he was showing off his dangling pockets. Um, and obviously there's a kind of, a uh, clash of um, sort of male and female um, material culture or gender associations around uh, pockets which are thought as feminine but also could be seen as other dangling uh, things in men's um, um, uh, uh, groins. <laughs> uh, so like, you know, a, a, a kind of emphasized uh, uh, testicle to some extent, uh, uh, but something that is seen as very much female uh, and he's fencing and obviously the sword is another um, strong uh, symbol of masculinity uh, with a kind of phallic you know, symbolism and all that. Um, um, so, but we haven't got really into gender fluidity as such, but cross dresses, yes, they they use pockets and often the pocket were pointed out as particularly outrageous in the report. Thank you, um, Ariane. I think so. Um, we have one question left in the chat box, but I think we're going to move on to the next um, papers and we'll we'll get back to, to you and um, and to the presentation, um, um, I mean, to all presentations um, together at the end. Um, just to mention um, someone who left the seminar actually um, left a, a reference to an episode of the podcast 99% Invisible that was specifically dedicated to pockets. pockets. So mm -hmm. that's in the chat box um, if you'd like to pick it, pick it up. 99% Invisible is amazing. It's a great podcast um, if, if you don't know it. Um, so thank you to that. Just to say, if Barbara Berman is was interviewed as part of the podcast. Yeah, not surprised. Um, thank you so much. Um, I will now, now um, um, introduce Tim Gutwell, um, who's a third year PhD student at Paul Valéry Montpellier University. Uh, he's a member of um, EMA, so Etui Montpellier du Monde Anglophone, and a professor agrégé who, um, under the supervision of Christine Régnier, is now carrying out research on the philosophy of D.H. Lawrence, 
and on Lawrence's interactions with the major intellectual currents of the period. Um, Tim's research interests include the links between literature and philosophy, the enduring influence of Spinoza, and periods of crisis and social unrest. On a more practical note, he's also engaged in a permacultural approach to organic market gardening. Um, Tim's paper today is entitled Everything is Alive, Vibrant Matter in the Nonfiction of D.H. Lawrence. Tim, the floor is yours if you want to share your presentation. Okay, I'll try. Okay. That should be all right. Okay, can you see? I hope so. All right. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks to Ariane. I think um, I'm going to, I think Lawrence would have agreed that small things matter. And uh, it was interesting because um, one thing that Lawrence thinks is the objects are suffused with the vibrations of the people that wear them. And uh, we'll see that he mentions his boots, but I'm sure that pockets would have been the same, uh, same principle. Um, so today, um, my aim is to show that despite the gap of some hundred years between them, much of the material found in Jane Bennett's Vibrant Matter, published in 2010, was foreshadowed in, in the nonfiction of D.H. Lawrence in a way that I believe can be seen as, as both confirming and complementing her work. And in fact, I think, I suppose it might be more accurate to view it as a kind of dialogue across the ages. My, my personal belief is that after a century of intellectual drift, Many of the insights of the early 20th century have demonstrated their renewed significance once more. For those who don't know Lawrence well, I'd just take a brief moment to outline his work and to explain why my research interests fit well with this topic. Um, Lawrence is best known as a novelist or a poet, um, but he was a multifaceted writer. Uh, he was an artist. I think the, the painting that you, you saw before was, was, was painted by, by Lawrence. Uh, and he excelled in all genres of uh, writing. My thesis focuses on his nonfiction, which includes collections of essays, uh, notably, uh, as you can see on the screen, reflections on the death of a porcupine um, and some other um, uh, literature, essays on literature, essays on psychology and travel writing mainly. And Norris actually had a lifelong interest in philosophy. Uh, but his only completed overtly physical philosophical work, was, uh, at, which was called At the Gates, is probably falsely said to have been used as toilet paper by a victim of Lawrence's tendencies to base the characters of his novels on real life figures. Nonetheless, it's possible to reconstruct his philosophy from the writings that are still extant, and as I hope to show, his thinking remains relevant today. Oh, oh we're not there yet. So, um, by way of introduction, I, I would like to relate just a very brief anecdote. A few years back, I was preparing for the aggregation in philosophy, and the topic that year was the notion of life, of life. And in the introductory meeting, I asked whether a book called The Secrets of Matter by Etienne Klein could be useful. I needed to be put firmly but politely back into my place by the other philosophy teachers, who explained diplomatically that life and matter were two very distinct areas. Yet to this day, I have, found, I, I have found and I find the distinction drawn between life and matter to be an artificial one and the kind of abstraction Lawrence would have hated. Unsurprisingly then, I was sympathetic to the underlying hypothesis of Jane Bennett's vibrant matter that the division into organic and inorganic is at best a false one. Excuse me. Is at best a false one. And are worse responsible for many of the problems facing our contemporary society. Lawrence would also have been sympathetic to her contention that things have agency, as I intend to show. I've probably already done a disservice to both Bennett and Lawrence by mentioning the word thing, thing, as if there really were things, as if things existed in a vacuum. Uh, but it's difficult to do otherwise due to the limitations of language. And I'll come back to this later. Bennett wishes to co combat the image of matter as passive or inert, since for her, it's this kind of reasoning that has led to our modern day dynamic of conquest, domination, and hubris. This is a position Lawrence would have agreed with, as he made particularly clear in two of his travel books, Sketches of Utruscan Places and Mornings in Mexico. In the former, he contrasts the Utruscan civilization with the Romans. 
in the latter, he can trust the American Indians with the more recent Western settlers. In both cases, it's the latest arrivals who are found wanting. For example, Lawrence argues that the attitude towards the cosmos changed with the arrival of the Romans and the Greeks. Whereas the, the Etruscans had lived in a healthy harmony with the universe, the Greeks, and especially the Romans, wished to instru instrumentalize matter to dominate it. Lawrence writes, uh, you can see it on the screen, that the old religion of the profound attempt of man to harmonize himself with nature and hold his own and come into flower into, in the great seething of life changed with the Greeks and the Romans into a desire to resist nature, to produce a mental cunning and a mechanical force that would outwit nature and chain her down completely, so that at least there should be nothing free in nature at all. All should be controlled, domesticated, put to man's mean uses. Curiously enough, with the idea of the triumph over nature arose the idea of a gloomy Hades, a hell, and a purgatory. Um, similarly, in the series of travel sketches, Twilight in Italy, Lawrence describes the hotel owner who, who wanted to know the joy of man who has got the earth in his grip, bound it up with railways, burrowed it with iron fingers, subdued it. Lawrence and Bennett then both forged a link between our attitude to the material world and our will to dominate. To get beyond human hubris, we need to change our attitude towards things. Um, it is for this reason that in vibrant matter, Bennett aims to develop a concept of a thing as something active, possessed with a measure of agency of its own. She uses the term thing power. Hence, Bennett contends that the best way to conceive of things is to conceive of them as quivering, evanescent, vibrating. It is in this manner that we can correctly perceive things as dynamic with an agency of their own. Like Bennett, Lawrence views objects as characterized by vibrations. In Fantasia of the Unconscious, he writes the following rather startling passage, which shows that for him, we are constantly in connection with our surroundings and that this connection is physically or psychically characterized by the very real forces. Um, this is where you will see the reference to the, to the boots I mentioned. Between, between an individual and any external object with which he has an effective connection, there exists a definite vital flow. Whether this object be human or animal or plant or quite inanimate, there is still a circuit. My dog, my canary, has a polarized connection with me. Nay, the very cells in the ash tree I loved as a child had a dynamic vibratory connection with the nuclei in my own centers of primary conscious. And further still, the boots I have worn are so saturated with my own magnetism, my own vital activity, that if anyone else wears them, I feel it as a trespass. So there is a definite vibratory report between a man and his surroundings once he definitely gets into contact with these surroundings. In other words, for Lawrence, everything is characterized by movement whether it be trees, books, houses, or living creatures. And everything is in relation with everything else, as we will see. We may well conceive of objects as stable and permanent, but as Bergson had already pointed out at the beginning of the 20th century, this is due to our human nature, or hard wiring, as we might say nowadays. We are primarily action-oriented creatures. Paradoxically, as Bergson remarks in The Creative Evolution, Though change is actually the most permanent feature of our world, we scarcely notice it. As a result, it would then be more accurate to that that what we call things are not actually things, but events, albeit events that we conceptualize as, as static. Hence, as Lawrence, explain, as Lawrence explains, our view of the world is merely relative. What we see is fully determined by our perspective as humans. For example, Lawrence writes the following statement about movement in which he manifestly is alluding to Einstein's theory of relativity. When I am in a moving train, strictly the land moves under me. I and the train are still. If I were both land and train, if I were large enough, there would be no motion. And if I were very, very small, every fiber of the train would be in motion for me. The point of rest would be infinitely reduced. In other words, oops, excuse me. In other words, oh, this is all a question of scale. If we were a million times larger, the train would seem stationary. And if we were a million times smaller, we would see that even the metal on, of which the train is constructed is in permanent vibration. 
the very table on which he writes is in movement. Bennett, on the same theme, quotes Latour, there is no object, no subject, but there are events. I never act, I'm always slightly surprised by what I do. Things are always really events, even when we may not be able to perceive their dynamic nature. Replying to a query about whether the cliffs of Dover were an event, Bertrand Russell is said to have replied, yes, but a very slow one. Another similarity between the two thinkers that I would like to explore is the manner in which Bennett attempts to revisit the notion of the thing by describing the way in which there's always something elusive about the subject. She variously refers to Thoreau's concept of the wild, to De Vries outside, or an absolute of the object, as well as to the non-identity of Adorno. By contrast, in classical physics, a mechanical model had denied any agency to matter, which was consequently entirely determined and inert. Famously, the French mathematician Laplace, uh, which I can show you, uh, estimated that if the supreme intelligence existed, commonly known as Laplace's demon, which was capable of knowing all the positions and forces of all matter at any given moment, it would be able to predict the future just as well as it knew the past. Nonetheless, as Bennett points out in chapter six, this kind of mechanical model has long been superseded and is no longer even scientific. Lawrence and many others of his time had already questioned this kind of reduction, reductionism. Bennett, of course, doesn't mention Lawrence, but Lawrence had also had already developed a sort of theory of the elusiveness of the object about which I've already written and which looks at the similarities between Lawrence and Spinoza. Uh, Spinoza set out uh, three types of knowledge in his ethics and the fifth book particularly refers to the third type of knowledge, a type of knowledge which enables us to glimpse the eternal or the absolute in particular things, which Spinoza calls intuitive science and Lawrence would call subjective science. Deleuze uh, specifically uses Lawrence in his, used Lawrence in his lectures on Spinoza to exemplify Spinoza's third type of knowledge. Uh, Spinoza stated that the more we understand particular things, the more we understand God, and that the greatest endeavor of the mind and its greatest virtue is to understand things by the third kind of knowledge. In other words, we could, in other words, uh, by studying objects in detail, it, it, it's also an ethical enterprise. Uh, he also makes it clear that the third type of knowledge involves knowledge of the essence of things. For Spinoza, things are conceived by us in two ways. Firstly, in time and space, and secondly, in so much as they are part of the necessity of the divine nature, hence, hence conceivable as an aspect of eternity. Uh, finally, Spinoza states that there exists, there does exist a sort of eternity which we sense and which we experience but which is absolutely distinct from any kind of notion of immortality, since it's not derived from time or space, but from this intuitive knowledge of the essence of particular things. Um, in like manner, Lawrence draws a distinction between existence in time and space on the one hand, and on the other, the essence of things being which stands outside of time. Lawrence calls this realm of essences out, outside of time, of which we can only catch a glimpse, the fourth dimension, a dimension in which a thing is eternal because it is utterly unique and non pareil He writes, for example, that in that other dimension or region where the dandelion blooms and which men have called heaven and which now they call the fourth dimension, which is only a way of saying that is not to be reckoned in terms of space and time. In his lectures on Spinoza, Deleuze, Deleuze points out that in reality, the world is a set of relations. And for Lawrence too, as he says, everything in the world is relative to everything else. Uh, the nature of an object is by no means fixed. What is an apple? The answer is, it depends on the relation it enters into. Lawrence writes, what thus Lawrence writes, what an apple is or looks like to a caterpillar, to a thrush, to an action, to a browsing cow, to Sir Isaac Newton, to the tree it hangs on and the earth it rots in, I leave you to consider. In this manner for Lawrence, an object only achieves its essence in a relationship. For example, the dandelion root 
that really realizes its full essence in relationship with the sun, the cosmos. It's only in relation that we can glimpse the true fullness of beings. As Bennett points out, things never exist in isolation since an actant never lives, never really acts alone. Its efficacy or agency always depends on the collaboration, cooperation, or interactive interference of many bodies or forces. There exists, she says, a complicated web of dissonant connections. Or as Spinoza wrote in his ethics, things are not passive one or inert, but two way. They are, they affect and are affected. This leads Bennett to Deleuze's concept of assemblages, an assemblage being an ad hoc grouping of diverse elements, which has a particular particularity of generating emergent effects, namely something additional, the whole creating something more than the sum of the parts. Deleuze discussing Spinoza states that when relationships are constituted, the two things of which they are constituted form a superior individual, a third individual, which encompasses them and takes them as parts. For example, in relation to the music one might like to listen to, it is as if, it is as if a third individual is formed, composed of the self and the music, which are now become parts of something greater. Hence, every relationship is a positive addition and an addition of something new. And it is this concept of a third thing which particularly interests Lawrence. In the collection of essays, Reflections on the Death of a Porcupine, Lawrence advocates the necessity for a more balanced relationship between man and his environment, which he names after the Greek equilibrium. Not many people know that Lawrence had a cow when he lived in New Mexico. Uh, but in a faintly comic manner, Lawrence described the way he tried to get into equilibrium with his cow, Susan, or indeed with the chicken, which he, which he nicknamed Flatfoot. Nonetheless, the enterprise is serious and has to be taken seriously. As he points out, the chicken is totally indifferent to his human status. Getting into contact with things or other living creatures implies a certain humbleness and above all, a deontrocentric attitude. Lawrence is critical of mankind's anthropocentric attitude to the cosmos. Too much anthropos, he says, makes the world a dull hole. Indeed, for Lawrence, the Greeks never really attained a state of equilibrium with the things around them, since they saw things in overly anthrop anthropocentric terms. This is the mistake the Greeks made. They talked about equilibrium, and then when they wanted to equilibrate themselves with a horse or an axe or an acanthus, then horse acts and acanthus have to become nine tenths human to accommodate them. The same with women, with woman. When the Greek wanted to equilibrate with a woman, she had to become more and more a man, approximate to the man. Call that equilibrium. On the other hand, if I do achieve relatedness between me and all the things around me, says Lawrence, I hear the not me. I hear the not me, the voice of the Holy Ghost. Then I am in harmony with the universe around me. I have a connection with my circumambient universe and I know my place. This complements Bennett's reservations about the efficacy, efficacy of an environmentalism, which is perhaps overly anthropocentric, based as it is on self-interest and motivated by a very human fear of the environmental blowback of human actions. More effective, according to Bennett, would be to recognize, as, as Gattari, Gattari contended, that we are both of nature and in nature. Our very bodies consist of matter, our bones are made of mineral, our blood of metal, our neurons of electricity. The old binary of organic and inorganic, of inside and outside, has led us to a very inadequate attitude towards the world of which we are a part. In this way, in mornings in Mexico, Lawrence contrasted our attitude with that of the American Indians who he admired. For them, everything lives. Thunder lives and rain lives and sunshine lives, but not in the personal sense. How is man to get himself into relation with the vast living convulsions of rain, thunder and sun, which are conscious and alive and potent, but like the vast system beasts, inscrutable and incomprehensible. The American Indians see no, sees no division into spirit and matter, God and not God. Everything is alive, though not personally so. We make reservoirs, reservoirs and irrigation ditches and artesian wells. We make lightning conductors and build fast electric plants. 
be a matter of science and force. But the Indian says, no, it all lives. We must approach it fairly with profound respect, but also with desperate courage. In the end, approaching the world with greater respect could provide a means of com combating what Gattari called integrated world capitalism, what we might now call globalism, globalization or neoliberalism. A disease, says Gattari, affecting three registers at the same time, environment, social and mental. This is why Lawrence advocates ruled by aristocrats. Lawrence means this means aristocrats in the ancient sense of the term as men of excellence and specified that he certainly does not mean the aristocracy of money or the aristocracy of birth, since man is great according to as his relation to the living universe is vast and vital. Natural aristocrats are those capable of putting mankind into a new relation with the universe. Whoever he says can establish or initiate a new connection between mankind and the circumambient universe is in his own degree a savior. Lawrence must have had an ominous inkling of the onset of neoliberalism and hoped that these aristocrats would be able to turn the tide. In the coming era, he said, they will rule the world, a, co a confraternity of the living sun, making the embers of financial internationalism and industrial internationalism pale upon the, her the heart of the earth. To conclude then, Lawrence, like Bennett, attributed agency to things, approving the Etruscan and American Indian idea as he saw it, that everything is alive and that we should approach the universe with respect and even reverence. Through getting into authentic relations with thing of around, things around us, we can engender uh, a far healthier attitude. Often thought of as an individualist, Lawrence was the opposite and thought that the problem of humanity was that we have lost our connection with the cosmos. Reconceiving our place in the world paved the way to going beyond money, accumulation, and domination onwards to a far healthier, harmonious way of life. Faced as we are with the COVID ep epidemic and the menace of climate change, we might ask ourselves whether we should be more aware of the importance of living in connection with the cosmos. Thank you. Thank you, um, Tim. Such an interesting paper, and I think. Um, I might only be speaking for myself, but I think um, it's rare to find such an intricate sort of, um, 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 yeah, sort of mixture of philosophy and and um, and literature. So I think that will make for very interesting um, discussions later. Um, so let me, for now, introduce Constance Pompier, who's our last speaker for today. Um, Constance holds a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in English studies. Um, she passed the Egestion with honours in 2019 and obtained a degree in teaching. She is now a fully funded, funded sorry, PhD student at the University Paul Valéry Montpellier, um, Montpellier 3, so, you know, um, go Montpellier 3, this is, this is your afternoon, um, um, where she researches and teaches under the supervision of Professor Jean-Michel Gantot. Um, and she started her PhD in 2020 and works on Sarah Hall's use of the pastoral mode in relation to the current environmental crisis. And um, this has led her to work on the concept of materiality, as well as spectrality, trauma fiction, echo criticism, echo feminism, vulnerability, and the ethics of care. Um, today, Constance is going to tell us about matter that matters, the aesthetics of materiality in Sarah Hall's, Hall's water and how to paint a dead man. Constance, whenever you're ready. Right, thank you so much for having me and thank you Ariane and Tim for such fascinating presentations. So as human beings, we are surrounded and immersed in matter. Our existence depends on it. However, the current environmental crisis shows us that it is not yet considered as an essential condition of our existence. It is generally conceived as made up of inert particles outside of us, and the sum of these particles forms nature. New materialism in the United States of America and in Europe demonstrates that matter is in fact active both inside and outside of human bodies. The repercussions of such a shift in how matter is perceived are critical to understand the environmental crisis, the Anthropocene, and to adopt a more responsible standpoint on the matter that surrounds us. At the beginning of the millennium, Sarah Hall started writing novels and short stories that shed light on both human and non-human matter. 
Born and raised in the Lake District, she often uses it as a locus of her writings. Known for being the cradle of British Romanticism, the Lake District is neither idealized nor is it the site of nostalgia in her novels, but it is rather meticulously described as a place where both living and non-living matter thrives. Two of her novels are particularly striking in that regard. The first one, entitled Rosewater and published in 2002, recounts how a valley of the Lake District, inhabited by people who live off the land, is destroyed by the construction of a dam um, designed to provide the city of Manchester with water. The second novel, entitled How to Paint a Dead Man and published in 2009, follows four characters whose lives have either stopped or slowed down in four interwoven narratives. So Sarah Hall uses the concept of materiality both as a central literary theme and, and as an aesthetic principle in order to represent the human individual as a decentered subject, thus allowing a redefinition of power relations within nature and acknowledging the agency of matter. And this is what I aim to demonstrate. My talk is divided in three parts, starting with how Sarah Hall represents the social, political and environmental consequences of perceiving matter as inert in order to assert its vibrancy and agency. I will then explain how the human being is represented as living matter embedded in networks of interdependencies, creating a continuum between human and non-human matter. And finally, I will attempt to show how the pictorial and literary representations of the land intersect in the novels to address political issues and invite the reader to question their responsibility. So the inertia of matter is used as a justification for exploiting and appropriating the natural resources as a direct result of, of the way we see and represent nature. It is perceived as an inanimate reservoir in and from which humans dwell and help themselves. This understanding of nature is present in Rose Water through the industrial project to um, emerge the valley. Indeed, Hall shows how the Lake District is what Emily Valizat calls the contested land and has always been fought over since li the living and non-living matter it contains has long been coveted. The novel is peppered with references to past conflicts over territorial appropriation that mirror the current dispute opposing the water industry and the inhabitants of the valley. To the violence and the red conflicts that occurred in centuries past, Sarah Hall opposes, I quote, um, yes, I quote, the village would know, um, would know that it was, it was to be a, a civilized invasion, the valley annexed with great sympathy and dignity. So the adjective civilized, modifying the noun invasion, um, exemplifies the pervasiveness of unarmed violence in the valley. The indirectness of this conflict highlights what Rob Nixon calls slow violence. I quote, a violence that is neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but rather incremental and accretive, its calamitous repercussions playing out across a range of temporal scales. The industrial invasion takes part in a slow violence um, of the destruction of the environment um, and its living and non-living entities. In How to Paint a Dead Man, the aesthetics of the still life pervades the novel and is a metaphor for how nature is perceived. I quote, for city dwellers, nature is, in, is sorry, invisible, located inside the weather brought to their towns or inside their bodies when they visit the doctor to hear of its errors. They practice the language of still life as they approach. The aesthetics of the still life is projected on the way nature is pursued by the city dwellers of this passage, still, invisible, and as a literal natural mort. A shift in the conception of matter seems to be the essential stepping stone to take action against the destruction of the environment. This is the core of Jane Bennett's vibrant matter. According to her, matter is constituted of actants, a term she borrows from Bruno Latour, who defines it thus, I quote, something that acts or to which activity is granted by others. Action is therefore not a privilege only attributed to the human subject. The notion of agency is also central to Bennett's theory as she explains that matter 
as an adjoining capacity that is distributed across many ontological types. In both novels, nature is compared to a pulsating and living body. When Giorgio, a still life painter, uh, receives vis visitors, he invites them to pay attention to what he calls the pulse of nature. I quote, take your hand from your wrist, I'll tell them. Your blood pressure is not abnormal. You are not on the verge of, the, of disaster. Listen to this greater pulse. The earth grunts as it, as it dislodges and buds break open. Can you hear? The pulse will be there too in the place where you live. Nowhere is exempt of the service of nature. By diverting the visitor's attention from their pulse to the vibrancy of the surroundings, Giorgio encourages a decentering of the human subject. The pulsating quality of nature is also present in Rosewater, in which the valley is referred to as vascular, depicting it as a living organism, which could either be a human or animal. This translation of non-living matter, uh, or non-living to living matter, animates the landscape and highlights its vitality. So both novels give an example of how lively matter can be represented in contemporary literature. Hall refuses the, the, the premise that matter is always inert and represents the social, political, and environmental consequences of this assumption. Acknowledging and representing the vibrancy of matter generates care for the environment and its components and allows matter to matter. If we consider that matter is endowed with vitality and vibrancy, then the human subject ceases to be placed at the, at the top of the ontological scale and starts to be considered as a living being embedded in networks of interdependencies. Acknowledging, representing, and making these interactions visible is critical as it conveys how inherent they are in ecosystems and encourages human beings to preserve them. Karen Barrett's theory of interaction highlights the importance of protecting these interactions and interdependencies. The term interaction means that, I quote, there is no inside, no outside. There is only interacting from within and as part of the world in its becoming. She further advocates an ethics of mattering and wording, which is, I quote, about responsibility and accountability for the lively rationalities of becoming of of which we are um, a part. Rosewater offers a representation of this theory as the characters interact very closely with the valley. They depend on the climate to, to take care of their cattle and crops, so much so that according to Emily Valizac, these characters' features are characterized by a meteorological vocabulary and similes. I quote, every expression set and roughened and deepened by the wind and the rain the sun so that one cannot be accompanied without its partners. The climate of the Lake District shapes the features of the characters. The close interactions between human and non-human entities create a continuum stemming from their mingling and reaching what Stacey Alamo calls transcorporal reality, which means that, I, I quote, the substance of the human is ultimately inseparable from the environment. On this continuum, human and non-human um, entities are seen to come closer and closer until they blend. By endowing her characters with geological qualities, um, Sarah Hall exemplifies transcorporal reality by forging the illusion that both human beings and the land have a body in common. The paintings crafted by Paul Level, the local painter, uh, I quote, reveal rocks in the shape of people and represent people of kept stone. The repeated mention of characters as stone and stone as characters might refer to the Anthropocene defined by Federal as a geological epoch during which human activity became the dominant geological constraint before those who had prevailed up to that point. So the interconnectedness between living and non-living matter is explicit here as human activity is shown to have caused a shift in geological time. So representing this interconnectedness in a literal way um, by morphing characters into stone and stone into characters might be a way um, to make the reader aware of the current era we live in during which the geological fabric of the earth is so much determined by human action that the environment is endangered. As suggested in the title, a central element in Rosewater is precisely water. 
It is omnipresent in the novel as another vector of transcorporal reality. Indeed, Daniel Lear argues that in the novel, water is, I quote, a substance that transcends its own materiality, transforming itself back and forth across the human and non-human divide. Like rocks, water shapes the inhabitants of the valley, who are often uh, associated and identified with liquidity. The main character of the novel, Janet Lyburn, is described as, I quote, a statue of rain, and her brother, Isaac, is described as an intermediary between a watery creature and a human being. Water, whether in the shape of rain or in the final flooding, invades the valley. The metamorphosis of flesh into water is reciprocal, as water also takes the form of a human body when pools of melt water are compared to blood, which has, I quote, spilled out of the warmed veins of hills. Mardell's inhabitants seem to emerge from the conflation of geological um, matter, water, and climate, so that they are made of the properties of the land. There seems to be a commutation of soil and substance that suggests that the people and the landscape are indivisible. So how to paint that man and horse water argue that matter actually matters as they both display the, embedded, the embedding between living and non-living matter and thus destabilize the ontological hierarchy that asserts that the human being is a superior being. Shifting our conception of the environment to acknowledge interconnected matter requires specific and reflexive representations that allow different forms of art to collaborate. In Horsewater and How to Paint a Dead Man, two modes of representation are used so as to transform previous perceptions of matter and to question the reader's responsibility for their environment. The first one, the pastoral, is a mode of writing that is often thought to be absolute because it is known for its artificial landscapes, its conception of nature as a refuge from urban worries, and its idealization of agricultural activities. In traditional views of the mode, nature is fixed into an image of inertia. Still, as the environmental crisis uh, became an increasingly urgent topic to approach, to, to approach uh, the pastoral evolved into new modes of writing, such as the anti-pastoral and post-pastoral, according to Gifford. The anti-pastoral is often found in corrective writings and engages with the pastoral conventions, while exposing how they differ from reality. In Horsewater, for example, the lives of farmers are depicted with an almost photographic realism. The novel also falls in the category of the post-pastoral that includes um, an eco-critical reflection of a relationship with nature. Post-pastoral goes beyond the limits of pastoral and still according to Gifford, I quote, takes into account the urgent need for responsibility and advocacy for the welfare of the environment. How to Paint a Dead Man displays a few references to the pastoral and post-pastoral tradition. Giorgio compares um, the bottles that he paints to a flock of which he would be the shepherd. I quote, sometimes the bottles seem to be huddled like ceramic flocks sheltering from a storm. And I think of the old shepherds with their herds moving like the shadows of clouds across the hills. The traditional pastoral is invoked through the mention of the old shepherd and the flock. However, the flock here is inanimate as it is made of ceramic, which is reminiscent of how the pastoral used to immobilize flock and shepherds into artificial images. The pastoral is closely connected with the notion of iconotextuality, since the first known occurrence of pastoral poetry was enclosed in Theocritus' Edels. The Greek word for Edo, idyllian, means a small picture, implying that it only represents a small section of reality. The pastoral then closely intertwines image and text in order to encapsulate an artificial version of rural life. Hall uses the pastoral convention of associating image and text in order to question our perception of nature and matter, and in doing so, enlarging the small picture of the Edo into a bigger picture. In whose water, four levels paintings of the Lake District are included in the narration in short ecrosies, uh, which in Lilian Nouvelle's words, translate the visible into the legible, so as to inform the narration with a visual equivalent of the representation of the landscape. I quote, humans are jigsawed into a cliff or river or hewn out of the landscape, a man's torso kept, kept in a cairn of rock, 
a child in the womb of a mountain wall, vast amal amalgams of environment and humanity. They are almost always secondary, hardly existing at all against the background. These images speak a certain amount of truth for those who live with the land. The description questions um, the place of the human subject among the environment as nature comes to the foreground and individuals remain in the background, thus reversing the traditional composition of landscape paintings. Individuals are not represented as whole beings, but through synecdochic body parts. The commutation of the noun jigsaw into a verb, along with the use of the verb to hew out, suggests a fragmentation and an eviction of human subjects from the land and its representation, reversing the traditional pastoral depiction of human subjects mastering the land and subjugating it through artificial images. The still life is another mode of representation through which Giorgio, in How to Paint a Dead Man, paradoxically seeks a way of, of representing vibrant matter. I quote, he must feel the temperature of the bream, the death shroud of seas over it, and the cracking of the garlic skin as it is peeled. I would present him with the timeless gifts of the natural moth. Only then will he begin to understand living art. The paradox is clearly stated here and invites the reader to perceive through a synesthetic description that relies touch and hearing, the usually overlooked ordinary matter before us. The artistic metaphor of the still life is also a structural principle of the novel since it represents still lives split into a tetrapsic. The four main characters' lives have either stopped or are slowing down. The still life also informs the aesthetics of the novels as it is, according to Daniel Lea, I quote, based on a technique of layering tone and detail on each narrative in turn, as layers of paint might, might be added to produce depth and verisimilitude. The process of layering paint to add verisimilitude is described in a postscript of the novel, which is an excerpt from Senino d'Andrea Tenini's The Craftsman's Handbook, describing how to paint a dead man by gradually adding layers of paint. This creative realism is reproduced in the novel in which each chapter adds a layer of narrative to depict the characters as subjects of a still life painting. Sarah Hall shows, so to conclude, Sarah Hall shows how materiality can be used as a literary theme, a structural principle and, and as an aesthetic principle. The traditional conceptions of living and non-living matter as less valuable than human matter are shown as obsolete and destructive. Matter is described as vibrant and able to exert power. Acknowledging the agency of matter and its critical role in the sustainability of ecosystems leads to a decentering of the human subject and a recognition of the power relations within nature. Reflecting on how to represent a constantly evolving nature, she engages a dialogue with the pastoral tradition that fixed nature into an artificial, um, an artificial Edenic image. Indeed, she borrows some of its convention and well, some of its conventions and reverses them in order to question our perceptions of nature. Through fiction, the novels offer personal experiences with the land that are bound to question the reader's responsibility and adjust their gaze. Representation matters because, as Diana Cole argues, multiplying perspective is the only way to recognize that bodies and objects are simultaneously seen, um, well, seen and seeing. Sarah Rowe, by making a detour through pictorial representations, adds another perspective to her novels and therefore adds other ways to see and to be seen. Thank you. Thank you, um, Constance, for rounding off um, this afternoon quite beautifully, I feel. Um, I think I want to open the floor up to any um, questions uh, that might have arisen over the course of the past two presentations. Do we have questions? I have questions, but I don't want to be hogging the floor. No? Okay. Um, shall I start? So I have a, um, a question for Tim first. Um, and 
I'm sorry in advance because I feel I'm going to you obviously you're working on nonfiction. I'm going to ask you a question about fiction. Um, but yeah, so um, I was really interested in um, your the that insight you gave us into Lawrence's non-personal approach to being um, and I was wondering do you find that this affects his treatment of characters and of things in his fictional writing um, does his fiction sort of look at different ways of and maybe different scales on which to represent human beings in their relation um, to their surroundings uh, can I ask you a question about your question <laughs> When you said um, you said something about a personal, uh, could you just repeat the beginning what you said about them? Um, that that um, you seem to be um, um, working on Lawrence's non-personal approach to being. This idea that you can you can be without um, um, you can be outside of the framework of, of personality of, or individuality, and I feel that especially the tradition of the novel is quite steeped in that. I, our idea of, you know, with this kind of personal story or individual characters, you know, going about their affairs. So I was wondering whether you felt that there was um, a way in which maybe your reading of Lawrence's not fiction meant that you you read his novels in a different way or looked at his characters in a different way. Yeah, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it's a, a non personal approach. This is why that's why I I. I had a bit of a difficulty with your question actually right because it's a very personal it's it's all about relationship between uh, uh i suppose when i was talking about his relationship with things and things around him in the cosmos and that and that's all about relationships personally is personal because it's between yourself and, what, and what's around you um to, to to go on to um i could talk about character because there's one i did in my article uh, quote from a very famous letter that um Lawrence wrote when he said he talked about this the old stable idea of egos and said that uh, he was uh, trying to find a different uh, a different way of looking at, at characters um, and um, the the thing that um, he the, this is probably true is that he's trying to find something that's um, uh, in a character there is a there is some way of seeing something eternal about the about the universe. When he says eternal, it's, uh, like I said, it's not something that lasts forever, but something that is stands outside of time. So uh, he, um, I'm still working on it. So I, I'm, uh, but he, he does think that there's the, the universe is connected in some way, and so um, you can the you can get glimpses of this connectedness of the world. So you get uh, and everything is important and. Everything is interrelated. So he's, for example, at one time says the living sway the universe. So in, in a way, he's got he's going both ways. So it's not just from human beings to uh, inanimate objects, but also inanimate objects, for especially the sun, for example, and the moon uh, affect us in a very fundamental ways. And um, and it's in the relationship between the two, between uh, us as a person and us as uh, something else, or another character, another person, or another thing that uh, he, you can just get a glimpse of something that's uh, absolute, something that's beyond beyond the thing is what I was trying to say, something that eludes the concept of the thing. But I'm not sure that's a very good answer to your question. I'm afraid. <laughs> I mean, you just, you take the question, if it's not a good question, you just give an answer that sounds good and better than the question. And I think that's, that's the right thing. That's I wouldn't the right say thing it wasn't go. a good question, but I'm not sure I've paid for my, because I'm so concentrated on the nonfiction at the moment, like characters and things is of my field. So I'll probably- Of course, that, that makes entire sense. Um, do we have other questions from the floor? Yes, Christine Renier has a question. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, thank you, uh, Tim, for this uh, reading of Lawrence's essays. Um, I think you, sh you showed how um, Lawrence and Bennett center into a sort of dialogue over the years and how uh, Bennett helps you read uh, amongst other um, critics, um, how she helps you read uh, Lawrence's essays. Now, would you say, because this is something that struck me today, uh, would you say that Lawrence's uh, style 
which is so flamboyant and fascinating in his novels, to come back to the distinction uh, uh, Diane was making between fiction and nonfiction. So would you say this style, which is so flamboyant, um, becomes a sort of obstacle in his essays uh, to our understanding of his philosophy? Uh, th that's um, maybe one, one question I would like to ask you. And the other thing is, uh, you, you said uh, at some point that the, the word thing was problematic. Um, and so uh, when, when you come to your conclusion and the reference Lawrence makes to the Indians, and, um, would you say that at, at that point, the, the way in which the, he uses the word thing um, it becomes clearer. Uh, what does he make of this the distinction between object and thing? Could you come back to this? Um, yeah, well, well, to, to answer the first question, then in terms of um, style, yes, it's, it's a problem for, for my project in a way. And um, uh, the, most, the best known critic of uh, the philosophy of Lawrence is someone called Black, who argues that the best way to approach Lawrence is as a series of metaphors and, and to treat it like a, like a type of artistic writing. But that's, uh, that's diametrically opposed to what I, what I personally think. Because I, 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 uh, I once read that Kant, when he was reading, taking notes, for example, on Rousseau, took out all the rhetoric and all the poes poetic and just wrote down the pure arguments. And that's what I'm trying to do, actually, is to take out the metaphor, take out the art. Although obviously I, I, if I, I've always liked that aspect of Lawrence. It's not that I want to take it out completely, but I want to get beyond it, behind it, and then, uh, and then come back to it and see metaphors are just a way of illustrating uh, what he's saying, but the, I'm, I'm interested in the ideas behind it. And also, and because of the metaphors, uh, there's always a, an element of ambiguity in metaphors. It's so clearly that the, a lot of critics for, 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 for uh, decades really have always said that Lawrence contradicts himself. But I, I think that's because uh, it's very difficult to understand what Lawrence is saying. And, and even I'm still working on it now, but I'm making progress, I think. But um, I think there is a message. I think Lawrence actually in his head is clear. But because of the metaphors, it becomes it's difficult sometimes to clarify it. So uh, yes, I think it's that's my first the first answer, and the second answer is um, well, the concept of things is um, um, is a complicated one because Lawrence clearly um, uh, we we have to talk about things because we don't have any any other word for it. I was it was ironic when I was writing it. I was thinking how many times I wrote the word thing when really uh, like that's not really what I want to what I want to say, but. Bergson said in the beginning of the 20th century that uh, um, that's not, that because we're action-oriented creatures that that we, we 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 see the world like that we like to see things as permanent and stable when really they're not and uh, this is why he says it's incredibly paradoxical that we that we that we see or we see things as stable when really the only permanent thing is change in in the world. And Lawrence. Um, clearly subscribes, I mean, Lawrence did definitely agrees with Bergson that everything is in movement, everything, he, he, he likes Heraclitus, for example, that everything is in, is in flux. And uh, uh, if you read the introduction to Poetry of the Present, for example, you can see that he, that his, his vision of poetry was just uh, that everything was, was uh, he's trying to find a way to write, to write the, the movement of things and the fact that nothing is, nothing really is fixed and stable, that's, and that's just what the way that we see the world because that's a, that's easier for us as pragmatic people or pragmatic creatures to to get through the world like that um so um uh question so then so when he says everything is alive uh, i just think um it doesn't mean that he thinks uh, as a, a thing is a stable thing a thing is just a, our 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 limit due to the limitations of our language is the only way we can we can describe the world is to say everything in if you because how else could you how else can you describe it really then it, it doesn't mean that he thinks that there is such a thing as a thing if you see what i mean but it's just that there's there's no other way of doing it there's no other way of describing it you need a new concept for to say uh, to say to describe things as as as, as, as events well it's quite difficult to talk about events if you talk about events to say every event is alive then 
people just don't know what you're saying but that's probably what you should say really because every event is a lie not everything is a lie if you see what I mean. thank you thank you um it's still has a question Statue. yes thank you thank you to our three speakers it was really interesting i had a, a question for clemence uh, constant sorry actually uh, i was wondering um whether there was something specifically anglo-centric or british about um um the post pastoral as you describe it because you know you know if if i remember correctly you know eco criticism for you know that there's a branch that came from the uk and then uh, there's a branch that came from the us and they were based on quite a different set of texts and so developed in quite different ways and i was wondering whether you knew of instances of the post pastoral in america or even if there are um regional variations of the post pastoral around britain i don't know if this makes sense um yes of course it, it makes sense um, so I, I am aware that the post special also, also exists in the United States, mm -hmm. um, as I know that the special has been revisited there with an eco-critical, um, uh, through an eco-critical prism. Um, so yes, um, but in Britain, what I noticed in, in uh, Sarah Hall's novels is that in the post special, um, the notion of the English country house, um, which is, I mean, which is very British. Um, I noticed that it was revisited. Um, I noticed that the English country house is now considered as a remnant or a token for the old co conventions of fashion and what allowed um, certain policies, policies that were in place um, when the pastoral was uh, an important genre, well, mode of writing. Um, so I think it was one way of, I mean, it is one way of revisiting the pastoral conventions. And it is um, one of the post-pastoral tropes that you can find in, specifically in British literature. Um, and also the Lake District, uh, as I said, it is, considered as the cradle of British Romanticism. Um, so it's quite interesting that Sarah Hall comes back to this, uh, to this place. Um, she, and she, I mean, she is obviously aware of this. She mentioned several times uh, the daffodils uh, mm -hmm. that obviously reminds us of, of Wordsworth. Um, and I think it is very specific to, um, to Britain and especially to the, the north of, of England. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions for our speakers? Uh, I think Sourav had a question, uh, but it was a question for Ariane. Yes. I, I had a question for Tim, if I may. Oh, yes. go on. Um, yeah, I was uh, intrigued by a, your, a comment you made at the beginning, at the end, towards the end of your introduction, where you um, uh, kind of uh, were, when, when you justified, you know, your kind of uh, uh, bringing together Bennett and, and, um, and D.H. Lawrence, although not writing at the same time, kind of having a, a conversation. Um, and you kind of, but I, I, I didn't, um, I couldn't uh, write it down exactly what you said, but you kind of said something like you see um, uh, a lot of early 20th century and late 19th century um, authors being not cannibalized, but kind of precursors. Can you just um, come back to that? Sorry if um, yeah, uh, yeah. Was a well, uh, it's a bit of a throwaway comment, I suppose, but um, I said that my personal belief is that after a century of intellectual drift, many of the insights of the early 20th century have become like back to coming to fashion again. I'm thinking of things like um, um, science, for example, science in the beginning of the 20th century was much more questioned, much more interrogated and, mu and much less uh, accepted than it, than it came to be in the 20th century. And uh, I would say that that's that tendency is sort of reserved, reversed. For example, it, um, the idea that you could break down 
uh, biological things into physical and chemistry uh, and reduce everything down to, to physics in the end. Uh, that that thing came into the, everyone believed that because uh, and then they when we discovered DNA that seemed to confirm that you could just take a living creature break it down into bits and then break it down into individual atoms and it could just explain everything. Um, that's all fallen out of fashion as as the century went along and uh, nowadays it's pretty um, old hat really I would say. Um, things like uh, emergence emergencism like for example in biology the, the the idea that the whole is greater than the parts, that, that's definitely related to the same, same sort of theme. But um, the idea nowadays that um, there's something emerging out of a whole, this is what I was saying really about relationship. In the relationships, you add in something that isn't there in the two individual parts. So uh, in biology, that can I, I can't do without it, actually. I, I listened to a course about biology, and they said that they... they they need that concept of emergence to explain things because in life there's there's, there's something that goes beyond um, b just goes beyond physical physical facts. So um, all that was in the in the in the background in the beginning of the 20th century, and I think uh, it's all coming back now again. I mean, there's there's a lot of other things as well, but um, you know, I also think uh, to do with neoliberalism and uh, that kind of globalization that's took over completely in the end of the 20th century and became the dominant doctor. And uh, that's clearly going to, that's falling into disarray too. So I, and I think that that was already being criticized in a lot of ways at the beginning of the 20th century. And then it just fell away. So, so there's quite a few things. In it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think we've run over quite badly, actually, um, and, which is all on me, obviously, because I'm supposed to be um, master of ceremonies and um, I was just enjoying myself too much. But I think um, we, we sort of need to, um, um, to, to let everybody um, go on their way um, happily. So um, if um, nobody minds and if nobody has an urgent question left, I think I'm going to um, round this up now. So um, I'd like to... Thank again our three wonderful speakers for bringing this series of webinars to a close with such fascinating insights into material culture and its connection with practices of telling and narrating. Um, this was a special session for us as it didn't just round up our exploration of de-anthrocentrism and the politics of matter, but also constituted the last of nine webinars dedicated to the present and future of humanities and human sciences in the context of Critical, of a critical deconstruction of anthropocentrism and you know, maybe of the, the category of the human himself. Um, I think we couldn't have hoped for, for a more engaging, more lively uh, moment of research in action. So we're just going out with a bang um, for now and expecting to be in touch very soon, um, of course. Um, and as we take our leave um, now, we wish you all the best for the coming days and hope that they involve you know, walks in nearby parks or gardens and uh, not too much cruelty in this month of April, but rather the smell of new bloom and general rebirth. Um, take good care of yourselves and we hope to see you all very soon. Thank you, bye. Bye everyone, thank you.